Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Shahid Mahmood, and I'm working as an ontologist in PNS Shafa. First of all, my most humble apologies that I could not uh, attend this magnificent gathering in person because of my service reasons. However, I am joining you on this Zoom link. Uh, today, uh, I'll have a talk uh, about stroke in the newborn, and I'll be discussing the classification, manifestations, diagnosis, and the treatment modalities. I have selected this topic that uh, we are encountering this problem regularly in our neonatal units and with the availability of uh, neuroimaging modalities in the majority of our, of our units in the country, uh, we are uh, coming up with this problem. And so I thought that it will be uh, important to discuss and share some of the thoughts with you all. So uh, perinatal stroke is defined as acute neurological syndrome with chronic sequelae due to cerebral injury of vascular region occurring between 20 weeks gestation and 28 days of postnatal life. And the disorders that make up this group that include arterial ischemic stroke, cerebral venous thrombosis, and primary intracerebral hemorrhage. It is a common cause of acute neonatal encephalopathy and usually manifest as seizures, altered mental status, and sensory motor deficits. Uh, classification would involve the perinatal stroke uh, being cerebrovascular event uh, from 20 weeks of gestation to 28 days postnatal life. Modern definitions of perinatal stroke incorporate the timing of the condition and major clinical anatomic stroke subtypes. Temporal classification is based on neuroimaging and clinical features and distinguishing that distinguishes the two important groups. Acute perinatal stroke uh, can be defined as the events verified by the clinical and radiological features starting from birth up to 28 days, and the underlying uh, presentations would be acute encephalopathy, seizures, focal neurological deficits, and altered mental status. While on the other hand, there is an entity which is not being revealed in the neonatal period known as presumed neonatal uh, perinatal stroke, uh, so exact time of onset are inferred as perinatal from birth to 28 days of life. And it is based upon the clinical uh, and imaging findings. Clinical presentation is a chronic one. So it is a chronic static focal neurological deficit or CS emerging during first year of life in the absence of an acute encephalopathy. And the imaging that is done secondary to evolution of the uh, clinical features uh, would reveal a remote arterial tetry infarction or periventricular venous infarction. <clears throat> there are different clinical anatomic subtypes, uh, including arterial ischemic stroke, where the infarct confirms to the vascular occlusion in the arterial tetry, hemorrhagic stroke, cerebral synovenous thrombosis, also known as a CSVT. It may or may not cause infarction and hemorrhagic infarction, periventricular venous infarction. Uh, that would uh, include focal acute or chronic infarction in the periventricular white matter, not confirming to an arterial territory. And it is often associated with general matrix hemorrhage and cerebral ischemic infarction. Now, what are the causes of arterial ischemic stroke? It can be grouped into three types, emboli of cardiac, transcardiac, or aortic arch origin, disorders of cerebral arteries and thrombosis due to disturbed hemostasis. This slide shows is an excellent slide which shows uh, the pathogenesis and the three main groups of arteriopathy, thrombosis and embolism. The important in the arteriopathy group is certain malformation that is faces uh, and hypoplasia, traumatic compression of the, uh, that includes cervical artery dissection, herniation or direct compression from the subdural or cerebral edema, and very common infection, arteritis due to meningitis, and genetic thrombophilias, and sepsis, hypoxemia, hypovolemia, DIC, hypertension, and the important cause of the embolism would be the congenital heart defects. So the fairly common problems that we encounter in our neonatal units can lead to this problem, and uh, we should be 
quite prepared that uh, to not only to diagnose, uh, but, uh, to suspect, diagnose, and treat the perinatal stroke. Uh, the causes would be uh, it can arterial ischemic stroke can originate from the maternal placental, or there are fatal or neonatal conditions, or it can be a combination. So in a cohort of 94 cases of perinatal arterial ischemic stroke, uh, embolism was in 33%, while meningitis sepsis 9%, and other causes that include hypoxic ischemic events, ECMO, blood loss, dehydration, that was 17%. Uh, thromboembolism is the common cause of perinatal cerebral infarction. Clear embolic source is uh, readily not identifiable, and newborn are risk for emboli to cerebral vessels. Thrombosis of placental vessels normally occurs at the time of uh, the end of pregnancy, and placental pathology may lead to direct embolization fetal, into the fetal circulation, or it may induce uh, an inflammatory or prothrombotic state. And then congenital cardiac defects, they can with uh, right to left shunt, they can lead to thromboembolism. And again, uh, with the uh, uh, increased use of uh, indwelling arterial catheters, indwelling uh, catheters, it can lead to this problem as well. Now the border zone infarction is a watershed or border zone uh, between along with the boundaries of major arterial territories in the parasagittal cortical regions. These regions are prone to ischemia under conditions of the global brain hypoperfusion or oxygen deprivation. So when cerebral oxygen delivery falls, a characteristic pattern of ischemic lesion develops in the border zone regions. Lesions may be asymmetric or focal. The maternal risk factors uh, would include uh, autoimmune and prothrombotic abnormalities, antiphospholipid syndrome, preeclampsia, maternal diabetes, placental thrombosis or abruption, as already discussed, from chorioaminitis, intrapartum maternal fever, smoking, and history of infertility. So again, if you uh, uh, see there, that there are the common factors or the denominators that are common for uh, risk factors for sepsis as well. And sepsis in itself can cause to or uh, can lead to perinatal stroke. So we really have to uh, look this and be cautious about the presentations. The neonatal risk factors, uh, we, uh, uh, we have seen that it is meningitis, sepsis, global hypoxemia, dehydration, hyponatremia, DIC, hypoglycemia, polycythemia, and certain mutations. The common uh, causes or the common uh, causes that are happening in, the, in our neonatal units. Among the prothrombotic disorders, uh, they contribute to perinatal stroke, but the evidence is weak. And the risk factor for uh, arterial ischemic stroke would be factor V laden, congenital deficiency of protein C, S, and antithrombin 3, and uh, some genetic mutations and antiphospholipid antibodies. Now, cerebral synovasin thrombosis, uh, it causes, uh, it is associated with hemorrhage, and it, can, it presents as seizures, altered consciousness, and physiological factors may predispose to uh, cerebral synovenous thrombosis. And thrombosis may be precipitated by damage to cerebral sinus structures at the time of birth by cranial molding, by the pressure on the skull, and it can lead to, and if, if it is uh, superadded by sepsis, by infection, and uh, hypoxemia, ischemia, and then it can lead to catastrophic uh, outcome. No, these are the risk factors. Is, uh, uh, you can have a look in the maternal risk factors. We have already uh, uh, seen that is from autoimmune problems, uh, history of infertility, prothrombotic abnormalities, and the important neonatal, fetal and neonatal risk factors are congenital heart disease, dehydration, hypoglycemia, infection, and cephalopathy and polycythemia, along with prothrombotic disorders. Now the hemorrhagic stroke is acute neurological syndrome. There are the two main forms, hemorrhagic conversion of ischemic infarction of arterial or venous origin and primary intracerebral hemorrhage. Hemorrhage conversion of ischemic infarction is a major cause of neonatal hemorrhagic stroke. And the most causes of primary intracerebral hemorrhage are idiopathic. Either they can be attributed to bleeding diathesis, vascular anomalies, or certain mutations may lead to in utero hemorrhage. 
Hemtic stroke uh, in a population-based case control study, 86 cases of neutral hemtic stroke were identified and no definitive cause could be determined for many cases of primary intracerebral hemorrhage. Periventricular hemorrhagic infarction is part of spectrum of germinal matrix and uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. As uh, we all know, it is more common in premature infants, less in term and near term infants. In a series of more than 5,000 infants, uh, low birth weight, the more uh, the birth weight was low, it was associated with more incidence of periventricular hemorrhagic infarction. As we can see that in the uh, group in which the birth weight was less than 750 gram, it was associated with 10%. So mortality rate of infants in this group would be up to from 30 to 60%. Uh, it occurs into 15 to 20% of premature infants and the infarction is asymmetric in contrast to the symmetric infarction that is typical of periventricular leukomalacia. Uh, periventricular leukomalacia refers to the injury of cerebral white matter and it is the correct distribution and consists of periventricular focal necrosis with subsequent cyst formation and diffuse cerebral white matter injury. It is a major white uh, brain white matter injury that affects premature infants and preterm infant periventricular white matter are vulnerable to ischemic insult. And it can result from infections or cytokine exposure. And diagnosis is typically made by ultrasound scan, which is readily available in our uh, neonatal units. But uh, we all know that MRI has greater sensitivity and anatomical characterization. Hemorrhagic paraventricular leukomalacia, uh, unlike middle cerebral artery lesions, it involves uh, the legs more than arms and face, and it is usually on the left side and is worse on the left than on the right side. Different books have quoted different epidemiology. I was searching the literature and the best I could find was it has, it has quite wide variability depending upon the case definition and the time, but it has been reported from 13 to 45 per 100,000 life birth. It ranks only second only to ischemic stroke in older adults and exceeds in childhood by approximately tenfold. And if we talk about the percentage, so arterial ischemic stroke is maximum that is 70% with second hemorrhagic stroke, which is about 20%. Uh, clinical manifestation are uh, uh, as the newborn or the neonate has a limited repertoire of uh, clinical manifestation. So the, the uh, the clinical appearance or the clinical picture would be as it is the denominator of so many other uh, uh, pathophysiology or clinical problems. Uh, the important uh, clinical uh, presentation would be encephalopathy, seizures, hypotonia, focal neurological deficits, respiratory impairment, and feeding problems. So in the arterial ischemic stroke group, uh, they present during infancy with chronic focal neuromotor impairments due to perinatal vascular insert along from either arterial or venous infarctions. The most common uh, signs would be seizures, can be focal, typically contralateral to affected hemisphere, hemiparesis and respiratory and feeding difficulties, sensory deficits, disturbed temperature control and sleep-wake cycle. Seizures and alterations in consciousness uh, are common uh, in uh, CSVT. In a pediatric, uh, Canadian pediatric ischemic stroke study, uh, decreased level of consciousness and jitteriness was present in 58% and focal signs in up to 30%. And the involvement, superior sagittal uh, was, sinus was involved in 62% and lateral sinuses were affected in about 40%. Uh, infarction or hemorrhage may be present as isolated lesions or may be combined. In an international pediatric stroke study, similar clinical presentations were reported among 84 uh, prospective renal units with isolated symptomatic CSVT. 67 newborn had complete data and neuroimaging findings. Both ischemic infarction and hemorrhage was present around in 39%, and hemorrhagic infarction or other hemorrhage was present in 19%. And no hemorrhage or infarct was seen in around 34% of the cases.
Hemorrhagic stroke uh, present in early uh, days of life with encephalopathy, seizures, hypotonia, focal weakness, apnea, or poor feeding. Periventricular hemorrhagic infarction, uh, it uh, predominantly affects preterm and present, but presentation can be either silent, stuttering, or catastrophic. Stuttering evolves over hours to several days. A clinically silent syndrome, however, can be present in up to 50% of the cases detected by brain ultrasound scan. So now the question arises that when we have this problem, this, the pathophysiology, uh, apart from the pathophysiology, the underlying mechanisms or the risk factors, they are seen to so many other conditions. And the clinical features we have seen, they are common to so many other conditions. The, when, we, when we have to suspect, when should we be suspecting the perinatal stroke? So it should be suspected in any newborn with signs or symptoms of encephalopathy, seizures, lethargy, hypotonia, or it can be simple feeding difficulties, repeated apnea, or focal neurological deficits. Once a newborn is suspected to have perinatal stroke, initial evaluation would include naturally the brain or neurovascular imaging, lab studies, and infants who are acutely symptomatic with stroke, they can again present with seizures. And once uh, it is very important that any baby, any newborn presenting with seizures that warrants a complete evaluation to exclude other etiologies, including uh, one should not be forgetting systemic infection that this is the most common cause of seizures. And after infection, this is the causes of the acute symptomatic seizures. So, the diagnosis of parental stroke is confirmed by presence of one or more relevant ischemic or hemorrhagic brain lesions on neuroimaging that account for the clinical presentation. So in order for all the clinical features that are present, we have to have the underlying neuroimaging that would confirm the hemorrhagic brain lesion and that, is able, and that explains the appearance of this neurological or the clinical presentation. We all know uh, uh, MRI and CT, it is readily available in all the major units of our country. Uh, we have gone so far, alhamdulillah. So it will uh, uh, confirm, uh, we all know that MRI is superior to CT as it is less ionizing radiation, it has more definition. And if we add MRI, uh, MRV and MRA, so it has greater sensitivity, <clears throat> sorry, and specificity to detect venous and sinus thrombosis. Ultrasound scan, it is commonly used in, for fetal and neonatal screening. It is readily available. And if MRI is not immediately available, it is naturally our first choice. And, but the diagnostic effectiveness is less sensitive than MRI. A one large report uh, revealed that head ultrasound uh, in the first three days detected only 68% of infarcts that were evident on brain MRI. So uh, brain ultrasound can miss a lot. We have seen that MRA and MRB, they provide important information about stroke. Uh, MRA and MRV clarify the territory of the infarct when its radiological appearance is ambiguous regarding arterial versus venous origin. And MRA can identify, uh, can identify congenital vascular anomalies, carotid artery dissection, and congenital anomalies. Uh, now, one very important thing uh, that experts believe that we not only have to evaluate the vascular trauma uh, uh, or the vessels, vascular structure in the brain, but uh, congenital vascular anomalies causing perinatal stroke are probably underdiagnosed. So, the, if the, we will be missing so many causes if the evaluation fails to include cervical and intracranial vascular imaging. So, in addition to to interact in the vascular imaging, we have to include cervical imaging as well. Uh, in a multi-center cohort study of 248 infants, vascular abnormalities, including large vessel occlusion, dissection, congenital vasculopathies were seen in 22% of those imagined. And acute symptomatic peripheral uh, perinatal ischemic stroke, vascular imaging using MRA was obtained in 49% compared with CT NGO and catheter NGO in 4% and 3%. So majority of the babies, they were uh, being diagnosed uh, with MRA. So this is a slide that shows extensive cerebral synovenous thrombosis in a two-week-old infant with 
hypernatremic dehydration lethargy and bulging fontanel in this acute venous thrombosis this is hyperdense signal involving sagittal and straight sinuses and brain uh, resonance venogram that shows uh, absent signal and on sagittal t1 weighted sequence acute clot appears as hyper intense signal so this is hyper intense signal and uh, diffusion weighted image mri sequence they show extensive acute ischemic changes in bilateral subcortical white matter over here internal capsule corpus callosum and thalamus now the neurovascular imaging would include uh, transcranial uh, transcranial doppler sonography and conventional catheter angiography but these modalities these modalities are rarely used conventional catheter angiography i have very little experience and uh, probably i have not seen this uh, happening but the transcranial uh, transcranial doppler sonography it may have cerebral artery flow velocity which may be decreased in involved vessel it can have some utility and usefulness now whenever we are encountered with seizures we have to evaluate for seizures uh, acute symptomatic with stroke uh, babies we know that they present with seizures so comprehensive evaluation include uh, eeg monitoring uh, should be carried out and if seizures are persistent and the pointers are directing in this in the direction so uh, we have to uh, work up for the uh, inborn error of metabolism as well echocardiography we have seen that uh, uh, congenital cardiac problems are an important underlying condition for this group so echocardiography is very important and invaluable in the diagnosis coagulation testing is important uh, so uh, in certain cases otherwise there is no added prognostic or treatment uh, information gained from routinely performing comprehensive thrombophilia profiles is gained uh, but it should be done in all units with uh, cvt the normal findings may impact decisions about anti thrombotic treatment and testing of other family members as well uh uh let me tell you that uh, uh, it is important but I, because i had a couple of babies with uh, this stroke and when we did this uh, studies so they had uh, the levels of these proteins they were low reported low but when we checked with the standard text so it was normal so it is very important that whenever you do these investigations uh, you should uh, one should be checking against the standard text whether these are normal for the neonatal age group or not as these as these values are 30% of the levels of the adults as reported by the lab the screening of the parents can also be done and if the facility is available we can check for certain mutations and maternal blood should be tested for um, anti nuclear antibodies for lupus anticoagulants and homocysteine levels as well uh, now we come to the management uh, of stroke in newborn so the it is supportive management is usually supportive with the treatment of underlying conditions and prevention so adequate adequate oxygen ventilation correction of dehydration and uh, monitoring and uh, correction of metabolic disturbances antibiotic treatment if we suspect underlying sepsis and seizure management and seizure management is very important because sometimes it is it can be seizures can be very very difficult to control and we have to resort to a second or third line of treatment now i'll discuss in slightly detail about uh, the management of uh, different types in the arterial ischemic stroke antiplatelets or coagulations are rarely indicated all we have to do is observation and monitoring most thromboembolic strokes do not recur selected patients may benefit for the treatment and in accordance with the international guidelines and available data uh, treatment with antithrombotic therapy recommended for patients with risk of recurrent arterial ischemic stroke uh, due to documented systemic or cardiac risk factors so this is the age group uh, that should have that should be treated 
uh, as far as hyperacute reperfusion therapy and uh, mechanical thrombectomy, they are rarely used in the newborn. And where there is a very, very uh, little evidence or literature that whether they are being helpful or not. Uh, in the CSVT group, so unfractionated heparin or low molecular heparin uh, is used and anticoagulation is continued for at least six weeks. Repeat imaging with MRI and MRV uh, may be useful. And neonates who have not achieved clinically significant recanalization, duration of anticoagulation for up to six months with the aim of attaining partial or full screening recanalization of thrombosinuses is required. Role of systemic anticoagulation remains controversial, and we had uh, quite a number of babies of CSVT which we treated, and uh, we in two or three babies we had to resort up to six months for this uh, for the treatment. And uh, they had a good recovery, but some had, you know, a part, uh, residual uh, neuromotor deficits as well. Uh, I would like to quote that a very important 290 scientific statement of American Heart Association and American Stroke Association: anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin considered for units with CSVT, and uh, serial imaging at five to seven days considered to exclude thrombus propagation. In 212 ACCP guidelines revealed that CSVT without significant intracerebral hemorrhage, initial uh, anticoagulation with unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin should be considered. And it should be a uh, continued minimum for six weeks, but no longer than three months. For intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, uh, we need to, uh, uh, apart from the general measures, correction of the low platelet count, replacement of uh, coagulation factors and the vitamin K administration. General matrix hemorrhage, intermetrical hemorrhage, uh, we know that occur most often in preterm infants and treatment is usually supportive. In intracerebral hemorrhage, vascular imaging is helpful to exclude structural vascular lesions. MRI and MRA can identify large complex AVMs and vein of, uh, vein of gallon malformations. However, small AVM or aneurysms may be missed. Conventional angiography is technically challenging and high risk, and it is rarely if ever confirmed. Rehabilitation is very important in these babies, and as it, they can have long-term uh, neuro disabilities or poor neuromotor outcome, and it, uh, we, they need to uh, be treated in a center which is able to provide comprehensive multidisciplinary care with the monitoring of neurodevelopmental status, family well-being, and institution of individually tailored interventions. And interventions should include attention to health and well-being of family and integration into home and school environments. Prognosis will really depend upon uh, the type of the bleed, the underlying, uh, uh, the cause of the bleed, and the extent of the bleed, and the time and the success of the treatment instituted. It may cause, uh, the stroke may cause long-term impairments in sensory or motor function, cognition, language, or behavior, mood, vision. It may, can cause epilepsy as well. The bulk of data pertain the arterial ischemic stroke, which is the most common subtype of perinatal stroke. So long-term development can be normal in 19 to 14% in perinatal ischemic infarction. A study involving 46 children with perinatal cerebral infarction they were followed from 18 to 164 months and neurodevelopmental outcome was normal in 33% and abnormal in 67%. Neonatal hemorrhagic stroke uh, outcomes vary widely and mortality has been, different mortality has been quoted in different studies up to 25% and adverse outcomes that would include CP, cognitive impairment and epilepsy, they can be up to 77%. This is a slide that shows stroke uh, in a three-day-old term newborn with left-sided clonic seizures, And that reveals CT on the day of life three shows a focal hyperdensity over here, consistent with middle cerebral artery uh, ischemic stroke. And the brain MRI confirms acute infarction on diffusion weighted sequence and T2 weighted sequence on diffusion weighted sequence, subtle diffusion restriction is ipsilateral. Uh, in, in internal capsule, corpus closum, and thalamus. Uh, 
93 to 97 percent with CSVT survived the acute period. In a study from Netherlands, 52 new units with CSVT was follow up at median up to 19 months. Mortality was 19 percent. Epilepsy is very common. Uh, estimated prevalence is up to 40 percent after acute perinatal stroke and 67% of the babies can have infantile hemiplegia. Stroke recurrence can occur. In a prospective case control study, 215 infants were followed, a median of 3.5 years, and the risk of re and the recurrent thrombomolism was 3%. Now I come to the end of my presentations with the summary and recommendations. So management of perinatal stroke is mainly supportive, and uh, we have to provide adequate oxygenation, hydration, ventilation. We have to treat uh, infection and metabolic disturbances should be monitored and corrected. Seizures should be treated adequately because, because any time and every time a baby seizes, it causes brain uh, damage to developing brain. Uh, most thrombomolic strokes, they do not recur or progress. And for the recurrence arterial ischemic strokes with the documented risk factors, uh, antithromotic treatment is uh, warranted. For acute CSVT, even if there is a hemorrhage, uh, with or without significant hemorrhage, anticoagulation therapy is warranted. In the intracerebral hemorrhage, correction of severe thrombocytopenia, uh, replacement of definition, uh, def uh, deficient coagulation factors, and vitamin K should be administered. Perinatal stroke can cause long-term impairments in motor function. It can cause CP, uh, problems with the cognition, language, behavior, mood, and vision, as well as epilepsy. And there is a wide variation in morbidity and mortality that depends in part upon location and extent of brain injury. So we should be cognizant with any baby presenting with sign and symptoms as discussed, because there are so many other conditions they can present like this. So a whole work, uh, workup of the baby including uh, the work I've mentioned and neuroimaging should be warranted in order that we should not be missing this important uh, problem, important clinical problem in the newborn so that long-term neuromotor disability and death can be avoided. I, I, I thank you all for your very patient listening. And again, I'm sorry that I could not be present in person, but I hope that it served the purpose. Thank you all once again. Thank you very much.